Recently, Tom Woods invited Jeff Dice, Joe Salerno, and me to go on his show to talk about Murray Rothbard. I think you'll find it interesting. By the way, if you're not a subscriber to Tom's email, if you don't listen to his podcast, I strongly urge you to do both. You'll find yourself entertained and enlightened in a, uh, a unique way. As I always like to remind him, as I knew when he was a freshman at Harvard and first came to the Mises Institute, it was clear he was going to be a star, and sure enough, it's happened. All right, Joe, I'd like to start with you. In terms of Rothbard's work in economics, I've heard it said that the people who were at the South Royalton Conference in 1974, where the Austrian school really had its rebirth, everybody there was influenced by man, economy, and state, and that, that had been the glue that kept what was left of the Austrian school together. That's got to be one of Rothbard's major contributions, just holding the school together. But well, how else would you describe his contributions to economics? Well, first of all, to a man, the people at South Royalton were all Rothbardians. Every single one um, was there because they had read Rothbard's great works that he published in, in the early 1960s. How, um, man, Economy and State, America's Great Depression, and What Has Government Done to Our Money? Uh, his contributions to economics... Uh, were monumental. Uh, what, but really, what Rothbard did was to take the Austrian line of of, of thinking uh, that was more or less consummated in Mises' Human Action, uh, and 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 go back and find others who were Austrians but were living in other countries. People like Fetter and Wicksteep, people in in Great Britain, the U.S., uh, and 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 then weave together all of, of their strands of thought. Uh, into into a, a complete edifice of economic theory. So what what Rothbard really do, did was to um, update economics and in the process take into account all the progress that had been made in economics and mainstream economics since the 1930s when Mises and and Hayek really pretty much stopped writing or were uh, stopped listening to. I I think in, you know as a historian who has some background in economics that. If his whole career had just been the book America's Great Depression, that would be a contribution we'd still be talking about today, and we'd be honoring him just for that, because that's a great work of history. He makes connections I would never have made. He knows who's doing what and who's related to what person and who's working <laughs> where and who's at what university. And he's putting it all together, and he also knows, of course, economics really well. He spends uh, the beginning of the book going through various business cycle theories and why the non-Austrian ones uh, – have a lot of unanswered questions. That is a fantastic book, and that was released the same year Milton Friedman was releasing his own book that, in its treatment of the Depression, uh, took people on, took people down a, re a really uh, a, the wrong road. If I if I may just ask Joe to follow up just on that particular book. Yes, the first uh, sentence in Milton Friedman's uh, and Anna Schwartz's book is, "This is a history of the money supply." So they're not focusing on the actions and motivations and expectations of human beings. They're focusing on movements in some macro aggregate, some aggregative um, figure, and, 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 and approaching it as if th this macro aggregate caused influences on, 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 on other things. That is, the human element is, is really uh, dropped out in, in the uh, line of causation. It's not real history, let's put it that way. I, I remember, I mean, I've been reading a lot of testimonies about, uh, you know, from people who knew Rothbard in life and uh, wrote about him shortly after his death. Bob Higgs saying that I consider him one of the great intellectual figures of our century and, and so on and on. Bob Murphy, who has written study guides to some of Rothbard's work, says, the older I get, the smarter Rothbard seems. That as I go back <laughs> and look, I'm learning more and more from him uh, all the time. And in particular, I, I remember the, the story about Mises being told that, you know, Rothbard may have some disagreement with him on, let's say, monopoly prices. And Roth and uh, Mises' response was, whatever Professor Rothbard has written is of the greatest importance. So when I take these testimonies and I put them against, you know, a kid on the Internet, I think I'm going to take Mises and Higgs and the, <laughs> and the rest of them. I, I want to turn to Lou and Jeff and, and get your thoughts about Rothbard as a movement builder, because Justin Raimondo, not long ago out in San Francisco, uh, after a talk he gave on that new book, a Rothbard book, Never a Dull Moment, said that really without Rothbard, there would be no libertarian movement. I mean, there might be some 
people in the Republican Party talking about free markets, but would there be a libertarian movement? And what did you guys think about that? I always thought when I saw Hans Senholtz, who was a, a great economist, a uh, great teacher, great man, <clears throat> that um, this would have been libertarian and the uh, libertarianism in the Austrian school had it not been for Rothbard. So it would have been uh, much more conservative, um, much more, um, how shall I say, not anti-state, especially in terms of military affairs, and um, circumscribed. Murray um, broadened things so, I mean, his, his scope of interest and he was such an interesting guy, of course, as well as uh, intellectually interesting. Um, he just he he ab- he built the movement entirely out of his out of his own head and his own personality in a way that um, is it's it's a brand new creation. And so, absolutely, while there were libertarians before Rothbard, um, he is responsible for today's libertarian movement. Even those who don't like him, even those who condemn him are heavily influenced by him, although they might not admit it. So yes, it's it's absolutely, Justin is right. Uh, Libertarianism is Rothbardianism and vice versa. The other thing, Tom, is that he's just so accessible and there's so much Rothbard out there to read. I mean, at this point, who can recall who was the chairman of the Harvard or Columbia Economics Department in Murray's day? Who can even name the last five or six Federal Reserve chairs? How much influence does, does Arthur Burns have today? Whereas Rothbard... It's a great testament to him that that he lives on and that he he grows um, after his death. And from my own experience, uh, having an opportunity to go to UNLV and sit in on one of his classes and visit uh, with him briefly, he was so open to his students, uh, so willing to come to a little a little off strip place called the Stakeout in Las Vegas, where a Murray and sometimes Hans Hoppe would come with their own students on on a particular evening every week. And on a personal note, uh, for a friend of mine, he wrote a, a wonderful, a beautiful short letter of recommendation for him uh, to attend a particular law school. So this is not some ivory tower guy. This is someone who, is, who rolled up his sleeves and uh, got in the trenches, so to speak. And I love the fact that you can appreciate him on so many different levels. You can appreciate his economic journalism, his speeches, his his you know, approach to the general public. But then you read his scholarly articles, uh, and the Mises Institute collected them in a giant book called Economic Controversies, and you see the level he's coming from. And, it, and, and not to mention, of course, if you read Man, Economy, and State, it's astonishing that he was writing this in his late 20s and into his 30s and published when he was 36. I mean, it makes the rest of us feel, uh, I don't know, inadequate? I don't know quite how to put it. I was once at the uh, at his house in Las Vegas, and he had just come back from the Western uh, Political Science Association meeting. And so he had brought all the papers from the meeting, and they were stacked on the dining room table. And he at least went through and saw just to see if there was anything interesting in them, and uh, at least read in them, certainly skimmed, and some of them he read th- thoroughly. Every single paper that had been delivered at this not very important meeting, that you know that that and it, when you look at man economy and state and some of his other works it's just he, he was also totally familiar with the mainstream literature i mean he knew everything that had been written in the mainstream uh so he didn't come at this from any kind of uh um isolationist if we can use that wonderful word in this context position he was so plugged into everything and everybody uh throughout all of history all of economics um, and of course, he was a great movie reviewer. I mean, a sports expert, knew everything about the Olympics, knew everything about basketball. Um, what a guy. I want to say something about the Vietnam War because he had to split with a lot of the right wing because of that. And, you know, it would have been easy for him to just say, well, you know what? I'm an economist and I won't talk about foreign policy, you know, but that would have been like telling Ron Paul to not talk about foreign policy. It can't, can't possibly happen. So he becomes isolated from almost everybody. And yet he's trying to reach out to to people who will listen. He's trying to build coalitions. But there was a time when uh, Walter Block tells this story uh, recently at the Mises University program. Walter was asked, um, or no, Walter was saying that he asked Murray, how many libertarians do you think there are in the world today? And Murray said, about 25. Now, almost anybody (laughs) at that point would have said, I guess this doesn't work. It doesn't resonate with people. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, because Rothbard was, you know, but yet he he carried on. I mean, that the fact that he was courageous and, and and you know intellectually courageous enough to carry on under those circumstances is impressive. And then secondly, it is not fair to compare Rothbard 
to a lot of other people for a variety of reasons. For one thing, he's calling for no state whatsoever. I mean, it's easy, you know, relatively easy to come along and say, you know, maybe maybe we don't need this government subsidy or that government subsidy. But he's saying all services can be provided on the free market. There are free marketeers who don't even accept that. He's he's demanding that you fundamentally change the way you think. That's extremely difficult to do. And the fact that we now have, I don't know what the number is, but many, many, many orders of magnitude greater than 25 people who are outright anarcho-capitalists, nobody else did that. Rothbard did that. Well, that's true. And I uh, just to mention one thing about one, if we can call it a good thing about the Vietnam War, it got Murray his job at Brooklyn Polytechnic because he... Uh, like uh, Brooklyn Polytechnic, now part of NYU, was a an engineering school, not a great engineering school. Um, the only place he could get a job took him a while to get a job, um, and he ascribed it to the fact that they all they were all leftists, of course, like in every other university. But they all appreciated the fact that he was such a knowledgeable and passionate uh, opponent of the Vietnam War that he knew, f- you know, far more about all the all the issues, all the various peoples involved, all the uh, the, the government officials involved that he was just a world-class expert on Vietnam and the Vietnam War and the history of Vietnam, and they were all stunned by this, so they sort of forgave him his economics. Every once in a while you get some libertarian punk who, who writes an article about uh, Rothbard, and I saw one recently saying, you know, we should really admire Friedman more, and, uh, you know, Rothbard was, quote, politically retarded, and I thought, well, this is not really <laughs> the argument I want to be having, but as long as it's been brought up, uh, let me take a look at it. And so in, I personally think, although it's an embarrassment of riches, that the Iraq war may have been the single stupidest war in American history. So here's Milton Friedman on this question. Uh, you know, not exactly a uh, a libertarian titan when, when being asked about this. Uh, he's, he's interviewed and he's asked, you describe the concentration of power as the greatest threat to freedom and thus to the economy as well. Many people judge the current war against Iraq very critically for this reason. You as well? Friedman's answer, a clear no. U.S. President Bush only wanted war because anything else would have threatened the freedom and prosperity of the USA. <laughs> and then, and then in, in another, in another interview, do you agree? Here, here he is. Here's his bold answer. He's, at, he's asked, do you agree with President Bush that the actions in Iraq were necessary as a part of our war on terrorism? Friedman says, I think you can argue either side of that. Where I do feel strongly is that having gone into it, whether we should have or not, we must see it through. Oh, well, there's a great libertarian (laughs) position. And then somebody says, even if it costs some of our freedoms, and he says, there's no way to avoid a burden on your freedom. The costs themselves are a burden on your freedom. The restrictions that are necessary in order to get rid of the terrorists are a burden to your freedom. So there's no way in the short run to avoid a restriction on your freedom. But if we're going to avoid a permanent reduction in freedom, we have to see this war through. Now, I'm telling you, that is more politically retarded, if I may use that phrase, <laughs> than anything you know. All of us put together could possibly imagine. So, uh, but Joe, tell us about. And again, this is we didn't start this, okay? But Joe, what was Milton Friedman's view? So he's he's ridiculous on the Iraq War, a, a position that any any anybody could have gotten right. Where's what's his position on on Alan Greenspan, the absolutely catastrophic Alan Greenspan? Uh, actually, before I answer that, Tom, I want to talk about his position on the Vietnam War. Oh. There's, a, there's a myth out there that he was um, anti-draft and anti-Vietnam War. But in fact, he continuously lobbied to have the um, anti-Vietnam War, anti-draft people split the two issues. He didn't want the Vietnam War brought in. Um, his his um, rationale was, look, we just want to get rid of the draft. Uh, we'll complicate matters, we'll, we'll alienate people if we also attack the Vietnam War. So he wanted people to shut up about the Vietnam War. He wanted to focus on the draft and, and having a professional army. Now, for what reasons, I don't know, but, but he was not an outspoken opponent by any means of, of the Vietnam War, much to his discredit. Now, let me talk about his position on, uh, on Alan Greenspan. Uh, Friedman, um, from the 1980s onward, the, the, the great empirical economist, got almost every single prediction, major prediction that he made incorrect. And just to give an example of that, from 2001 through 2006, he made a number of predictions about the U.S. economy and how great Alan Greenspan was. In fact, uh, he sat down for an interview with Charlie Rose uh, in uh, December of of 2005. Uh, And and as you recall, it was in April that the um, housing bubble more or less burst and started to go down. 
And he went on and on and talked about how great Greenspan was and how we have not had this type of good performance from the Fed and um, unprecedented uh, prosperity in the American economy um, as we have had for the last 20 years under Greenspan or however many years it had been by that time. So he's very pro Greenspan and, and, and he, had a very, he had a blind spot when it came to bubbles. In other words, his, his own theory only focused on what's happening to the CPI. Is the price level going up or down? And if it's staying stable or near stable, well then, wow, the Fed is doing a great job. And then uh, in, in January of 2006, he repeats this more or less in uh, a, a Wall Street Journal article that he wrote, uh, at, where he says that Greenspan has set the standard, has set the standard for all future Fed chairmen. He goes beyond that, and, and, and he says that um, no, one, no, no one has done what, what Greenspan has done, and that he himself has given up his, that is Friedman himself, has given up his... Um, focus on a fixed mon monetary rule. He says, if someone could be like Greenspan, we don't need uh, a fixed quantity rule or, you know, which, which fixes the money supply. So he, he went back on, 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 on positions that he held for, for many years because he was so awed by, by Greenspan and, and his allegedly great performance. And needless to say, this, of course, helps to lend if Milton Friedman supports him, then this lends credence to the idea that Greenspan is a free marketeer. And so, you know, any, whatever, if, if Greenspan then later comes along and says, you know, I guess I just didn't understand the irrationality of markets, then, well, the free marketeer has been has been dethroned and demolished and smashed. Of course, the free market people should have been and were criticizing Greenspan. So this is a huge, huge problem with with Milton Friedman. And I, before I get all the hate mail, I, I want to hear these points addressed. Yes, I know he was good on occupational licensing and the minimum wage. I get it. That's wonderful. And I know he was a good debater and he could speak very well. And I, I don't take any of that away from him. But if we're going to be criticizing Rothbard by comparing him to, to Friedman, I mean, these whoppers, you know, I mean, I, I could excuse almost anything. Uh, of someone who at least doesn't make these errors, um, Jeff and Lou. Um, I again, I, what would you? How would you deal with this whole Friedman versus Rothbard question? Well, it's interesting that Friedman is put up by a lot of people as the more politically palatable of the two, and Rothbard, uh, the purist who can't get anything done, who can't get out of his own way. Uh, but if you if you look back at what he did in his career and in his lifetime, he was he was far more willing to reach out across ideological lines, across party lines, uh, to anyone who might share a libertarian perspective on a particular issue. Uh, th that, and if anything, I think at the end of the day, Milton Friedman was derided by the left and seen by the left as a puppet of the right wing and a puppet of corporate interests or business interests. And so in that sense, a, a vast swath of the country uh, did not take him seriously as an economist, uh, however much he might be beloved in conservative and libertarian circles. So, uh, you know, I think time and hindsight gives us the opportunity to say, well, who, who really was more effective um, and whose legacy is greater? And especially uh, when you consider some of the uh, things that Milton Friedman was involved in, like the withholding tax. I, I think that uh, in hindsight, Murray's looking pretty good and that uh, we see that movements have to be ideological. They have to be principled and that, uh, um, you know, Republican light has gotten us nowhere. Well, of course, it's, it's exactly true. And Friedman was a, was a brilliant guy, but he was also, and this is another way maybe of uh, defining uh, politically effective, he was a shill for the Republican Party. Whether it was Nixon or Reagan, you don't become a beloved guy in uh, Bush in Republican presidential circles. Uh, if you're if you're a principled libertarian, let's we just put it that way, uh, you have to be willing to to go along. And indeed, Milton Friedman did go along. So uh, uh, and he wasn't making arguments uh, to Bush about occupational licensure, although of course capitalism and freedom, he's he's wonderful on medical licensure and so forth. But uh, in his sort of practical life. Um, he was working with all the worst people in the country, justifying what they were doing, whether domestically or, or in foreign affairs. And that's why he was beloved, because he was, he was um, buttering up power. So that, that's uh, an unfortunate aspect. Some people would think actually, of course, that was a wonderful aspect because that's the way to get ahead. Um, but to me, a very unfortunate aspect of 
a brilliant guy who, you know, might have gone in a different direction. I know that at one point he offered Murray a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Chicago, and Murray didn't want to do it. He, for among, among other reasons, he knew Milton Friedman. Uh, but I've often wondered if Murray had gone to Chicago, who know, who knows what might have happened. Maybe he wouldn't have had any effect, but I don't know. Maybe he would have had an effect. Tom, Tom can, can I jump in here for a moment? Please. Yeah. Well, um, it seems that the juvenile libertarians tend to impute to Milton Friedman a lot of their left uh, libertarian views. For example, in, in the article that you're referring to that was up on the Internet, um, the uh, claim is made that Friedman, that were he alive today, would be pro-immigration. In fact, to his credit, Friedman said that it would be ridiculous to have open borders and free immigration um, given the, the welfare state that we have in the U.S. He made that point a number of times. No, it's true. He was not for open borders. Not all bad, Milton Friedman. When I just think back to my own, when I first encountered Murray Rothbard's work, and I, I got, I guess at that time, David Gordon had done a bibliography of what was then known of Rothbard's published work. And you know, then we still find some obscure newsletter he had written for, you know, like an investment newsletter. He writes a 40 page article that he publishes nowhere else. But we would all <laughs> like to see, you know. And so just the other day, I, I was reading his essay from 1959 on science, technology, and government. That was just sitting in his papers unpublished for years and years and years. He has entire book manuscripts that are still coming out. It was incredible for me to grasp this because everything I read by him, I was a young, you know, Ivy League college student, and it was more impressive than anything I was, re I was reading in school, that's for sure. And he could write across disciplines. You know, he writes for a new liberty, which is like the case for libertarianism to a world that had never heard of it before. And that was published by Macmillan. That's a big, big deal that 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 happened. But he writes, you know, the ethics of liberty has a lot of challenging stuff in it. He's got a four volume history of colonial America that he wrote as a spare time project. He writes the treatise on Austrian economics that keeps the whole school going and that shows his complete familiarity with all the mainstream literature. He's got the Panic of 1819, bringing an Austrian analysis to that period. America's Great Depression, showing how the Austrian theory of the business cycle can account for the Great Depression. Popular books like What Has Government Done to Our Money? thousands and thousands of articles that have then been collected into books. He kept up correspondence with all kinds of important intellectuals. He edited two scholarly journals, a bunch of other uh, publications, and was constantly encouraging students and young professors. What more could the guy possibly do at that point? I mean, what, what more could you expect? And I'm still just scratching the surface, not to mention what he did on U.S. foreign policy, U.S. international monetary policy. It, it just it never stops. You can't even stop listing all the things he did. So the motivation for going after this guy, I'm sorry it's hard for me to see it as anything other than perverse. I was like what Guido Holzman uh, said at the Mises University a couple of years ago. He was talking about Mises and uh, how to be a, a Mises scholar. And he said, uh, it is possible, as prolific as Mises was, to read everything Mises wrote. Uh, he said, however, I don't care who you are or what you are, it's impossible to read everything Rothbard wrote. He wrote such, this, this is a man who wrote more than somebody can read. And that's, of course, just one aspect of his genius. And he did this before the internet. <laughs> but, yes, before <laughs> the internet. <laughs> you would have loved the internet, of course. I mean, I mean, things that we would have had, to, you know, mere mortals would have had to look up <laughs> using Google, right? He just knew. And, and he produced all this on a typewriter. And I, just to think of all the simple ways that today we could have improved his productivity in a way it's, you, you know, it's maybe it's just as well because that we would never have gotten to any of it. Well, we were lucky to have him. All of us who knew him, all of us who learned from him, all of us who have been influenced by him. And um, really, he's a giant figure and becomes, as Jeff points out, a more giant figure because everything's up online. There was, speaking of Friedman, I had made a, a, a set in a blog that I thought, I wondered if Rothbard was the best read economist in the world today. Maybe it's Paul Krugman, I don't know, but certainly Rothbard's right up there. And uh, I said much more so than Milton Friedman. So somebody on, the, on David Friedman's blog, uh, David Friedman was upset about that comment, and somebody in responding said, look, this is not a fair comparison. Milton Friedman's books are all extremely expensive. All of Rothbard's books are up online for free at the Mises Institute. So you can't, it's unfair to say Rothbard is better read. I thought, okay, <laughs> darn right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, all right, any parting words from uh, any of you folks? 
Yeah, Tom, I, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, Rothbard is still publishing. We, um, one of our fellows, Patrick Newman, um, has put together uh, Rothbard's 500-page work on the progressive era. So we will have that coming out in the next year or two. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom, your your listeners should know that the Mises Institute uh, will be publishing another book this fall from Murray, uh, again edited by Justin Romano. But this is a, a, a about a hundred page treatment he wrote on libertarian strategy that he presented as a paper at a conference. So that's going to be out this fall, and I think it's going to uh, um, open some eyes as to uh, Murray's role and his thoughts as a tactician. Well, let me say that uh, I actually got to edit and write the introduction for another Rothbard manuscript now published, uh, The Betrayal of the American Right. Uh, J- Joe did the same for uh, Rothbard on uh, history of money and banking in the United States. So it's kind of like anybody who's anybody has to have written an introduction to a posthumously published Rothbard book or something. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, if we just judged him by the stuff he's produced since his death, he'd be a great economist. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Well, thanks to uh, Lou Rockwell, Jeff Dice, and Joe Salerno for your time today. Thank you, Tom. Okay, Tom. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for listening to the Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the LRC front page. Thank you. Thank you.